start by saying um, I'm going to look at these three projects as a way to think about the study of space and to illustrate for me particularly the way that space can be used um, as a way to understand what I think of as hidden aspects of social relations and particularly social exclusion. Um, I often get asked why space matters, at least especially in the anthropology department at CUNY, um, and why it's different than any other kind of theoretical perspective. I get challenged a lot. You know, why does it matter? Why is it different than political economy? And of course, a lot of what I do is political economy, or why is it different than the study of symbolism? And of course, what, what I do is certainly work with symbols and meaning. Um, but one of the things that I've tried to bring, I would say, from geography and environmental psychology, and I've also, at the beginning of my career, taught planning and design at the University of Pennsylvania. So that helps to make sense. I mean, I started out dealing with the physical environment and then taking it to other departments, is that when space is, is used as really space, as in its material aspect, you can get at information, ideas, thoughts, social relations that otherwise might go unseen. And I think a couple of the presentations, particularly the last one, um, was a great example of how space can tell you different kinds of stories than you would get through other kinds of narratives. Um, I also, in this presentation, just because that's what I've been working on, I've been working on a paper and also a book on theories of space and place. And I chose three kinds of history and memory. I, I'm, I have to say in this August uh, group that I'm not, I don't see myself as an oral historian, but I've always had friends who were. And I certainly do <laughs> like it. No, some of my best friends are all Some of my best friends are because I hung with a lot of folklorists. I also, my very first project in graduate school was an extensive set of seven life histories. And I do do residential histories, environmental histories, but I've never actually um, done archival work of oral histories or taken oral histories and analyzed them. But on the other hand, I would argue that I don't do anything that doesn't have a history in some sense. So in this talk, I'm going to employ, or at least in these projects, three kinds of history and memory, because it's just implicit in so much of my work. The first is going to be on the plaza, in which I talk about ethno-history, archaeology, and architectural history very briefly. The second, I'm calling them oral histories. I think I shouldn't, but, they, but Rodolfo, who was here in this seminar last year, collected most of the, the, uh, the at least the uh, vendor histories, and they were oral histories through a rapid ethnographic assessment procedure. And I'll talk about that in our workshop and how that works, how those histories work within an applied project. And finally, my notion, what I call residential histories of residents living in gated communities, cooperative apartments. So while they're not oral histories per se, or in the sense um, that I don't archive them, um, they are personal uh, documents and histories of individuals. I also, based on what Naomi, uh, Amy asked me, um, will try to indirectly, because it's hard to put this all together, you may have to help me, uh, look at different theories of space and place. And I use the example. So the first one's going to be the social production of space, which is how history, planning, design, how the space is produced, and how that's expressed in the physical and architectural environment, and how that communicates meaning and identity. And I'm going to very briefly do that with the plaza, which is a very architectural form. I think there are lots of examples here already today. Certainly, uh, Dodger Stadium is a great uh, example of the social production of space and how the history of that space and the place in which it's located communicates identity and meaning to those users, right? That you can't take the users out of Dodger, out of that stadium and out of Chavez Ravine without losing a lot. Excuse me, go back. The second is embodied space and the creation of translocal space. I've heard you talk quite a bit about embodied space and embodiment, and I'm particularly looking, I'm particularly interested in theories of space that are embodied through everyday movement and bodily practices, and among immigrants in the Wall Street market, how that creates what I call translocal space. Other people call 
use this term in different ways. And finally, in the last, and I think you're going to have to help me to make sure it's clear because the slides don't quite match this trajectory, is discourse and motions in space. Um, but um, which might I put it this way? Uh, one, there are a couple of things that are totally missing or just beginning in the first book on space and place, and that's why I'm working on another, which is the role of language and discourse and also emotion. In the new book that I'm working on, I have full chapters on that, which is, um, in the examples here, is how, how what people say about their homes and neighborhoods, in my case, right? It could be that one. Changes their meaning and their experience. In other words, gated communities with walls, gates, and guards tell one kind of story, but when you start talking to people and what they say about it and why they move there, completely changes how you begin to see that space. So to have taken language or discourse out of it, which I didn't, but it wasn't being, I wasn't, I think a lot of the literature isn't explicit. And the same thing with feeling. You know, we talk about fear of others and fear of a place. I mean, again, to make explicit how emotion and discourse play out in space. I see that as a different kind of theoretical approach that I haven't completely put together. That's what I'm still working on. But I see it as different than just looking at production, embodiment, or discourse. All right, does that? And then, um, uh, this is a disclaimer. <laughs> and it's for the purpose, you can just, I'll read it. The purpose of the presentation, <laughs> I do not focus on defining space and place or enter into the philosophical debates of which came first. In anthropology and geography and environmental psychology and landscape architecture, People spend half their time trying to decide what is space and what is place and how are they different. I'm not going to do it for you today. I just, I just don't think it's terribly important. I don't think it's a crucial issue. Um, there are good arguments uh, for what is, uh, which it is. In general, I use space as the broader term, and I use place as the more meaning specific. I used to, early in my career, say that space was that the physical environment, the, phys the physicality of it, and that place was space made cultural, given meaning. It doesn't work. It, it really doesn't, especially with all the challenges. So I just back off and I use them interchangeably, but you'll see if there's a bit of a pattern. I have more and more stuck to just using the word space and only use place in its very located meaning, like the place that I call home. I mean, in that very local context, to try to get out of it, because I don't think it's theoretically productive. I've read, I've reviewed the entire literature, honestly. I've spent a lot of time reading it. I just don't think it leaves me anywhere. I don't think it, to me, it doesn't matter. The ontology of, of whether we are born in places and, you know, space is abstract just doesn't matter at this point in time. And certainly space is the larger term, and it is very helpful if you uh, are a Marxist, or whether, you, whether you're a Marxist or uh, a meaning symbolist, you can use space as your term, and you don't have a lot of problems. So I'm not going to do that for you, though I'm happy to talk to you about it. And I also want to say that I know one of the questions that has come up is that, for me, um, I emphasize the material aspects of space and place. And by that I mean um, I ma I'm making the argument in, in what I'm writing right now, which is new for me, um, that anthropologists, I think, have one small advantage over even geographers um, in terms of thinking about space and place because our work is always grounded. It doesn't matter whether we're biologists, archaeologists, or field workers, cultural anthropologists. Um, we tend to be grounded in the field. Um, one might argue that's true for any oral historian as well. Not true for all historians, but that we're always grounded. And it is in that grounding, that and that constant grounding that you can't get away from, that space and place then, and thinking about it, emerges. And I think that gives us, a, 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 gives me at least, a, a fairly clear mandate of what I'm looking at. So when you, I'm talking about space, I mean, I'm thinking of, and this is what I'm thinking of, I ask her, does she mean a mall? You know, is it a housing? You know, I really mean the, the space. And that probably comes from my time as a landscape architect, planner, and teaching as an anthropologist in those programs, and trying to figure out what the social science had to do with planning and design. 
And also, I taught studio, which means I taught studio, that meant I was in there teaching design with the designers for a long time, 14 years, probably 10, at least 10 years. And then I could see how they were manipulating the physical environment and designing it to create culture or to create meaning. So it became quite clear to me that the material aspects of space and place were crucial and could be read, understood, analyzed, and used productively. Um, that being said, uh, space and place can also be used metaphorically, and one of the most powerful parts of it is that space is both metaphorical and material and can be that at the same time. So um, you don't have to, if it doesn't, doesn't trap you in any way, even if you say I'm, you know, a materialist. Um, okay, and so here's the final point that I want to make as introduction, is space and place are powerful analytic concepts because by studying spaces materially, you can uncover evidence. I said this in the very beginning, new ideas and relationships that would otherwise remain hidden, for example, and I will return to this. Uh, for example, the indigenous history of the plaza would be lost in a Eurocentric written history without without looking at the space and the architecture of the plaza. If you, in fact, it was. That's what I'm going to talk about briefly. Moore Street Market here in Brooklyn, it's a Latino market, would be seen as just another local marketplace without understanding the embodied spaces in the It just becomes any old, it looks just like any other market until you really begin to read the space and the bodies in those spaces and what they are making, which I'm arguing is a translocal space in, in a very um, material sense as well as a metaphorical sense. And residents of gated communities would be seen as just living in any old suburban house without the spatial analysis of what the walls and gates mean discursively. So that's, that's what I mean. In, in other words, these are things that you wouldn't get at if you weren't using some kind of spatial or in the first case, one could argue even visual analysis. Okay, so that um, I'm going to go fairly quickly over this because I don't think this is of as great of interest. Um, I was working in Parque Central in San Jose, Costa Rica, a um, long time ago, many years. I've worked there for a long, long time, and uh, wanted to know the history of the plaza. I've written an ethnography um, of it and wanted to know if. You know, I got very interested in the meaning of the plaza, and I did this huge social production, social construction analysis, and everybody told me that it was a copy of a plaza in Europe, and that it's just, you know, a European plaza. I'm sure you'll find it in Spain. The historians told me, I read the literature. The literature said it came from either the French Bastide was one argument, or Spanish uh, Santa Fe de Granada, which is where uh, Christopher Columbus signed the uh, uh, agreement in uh, 1491. It came from there, or it came from the law of the Indies. Uh, but then when I started looking carefully, here's Plaza Mayor uh, in Madrid, uh, the law of the Indies was a, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details. I, do any, are any of you Latin Americanists? Do any of you? All right, well, so just trust me about Latin Lord. American. Huh? <laughs> Latin American. <laughs> yeah, Latin American. All right. But, but um, the law of the Indies was a set of codes about how to build cities in the New World. And they were published, I, I won't go into all, but in 1573, that's the important thing. On the other hand, here we have the Plaza Mayo, and that supposedly uh, are regulated the spaces in the New World, and yet the plazas in Europe are newer than the ones in Mesoamerica. Right? Yeah, I'll show you in a minute. So here we have Plaza Mayor in Madrid, 1619, and supposedly the rules that govern this spatially in terms of its design and planning were what's being reflected in laws of the Indies that were published in 1573. On the other hand, um, I also, by reading the archaeological evidence, another kind of history, and I don't know how many of you have talked, have you talked about archaeology history here? So it's just another kind of historical document. So architectural history is what I was reading, and it all said came from Europe, came from Plaza Mayor, came from the law of the Indies. 
In the meantime, the archaeologists are telling me that there are some examples of continuous occupation of spaces in the New World, in Mesoamerica in particular, um, where uh, there was a, a concerted uh, cultural resistance by, in, in this case, Mayan individuals against Spanish incursions, and you could actually see it in the landscape. And not only could you see it in the landscape, um, you could see it by superposition, which I'll return. But the interesting part of all of this is Tenochtitlan, which becomes Mexico City, for those of you who don't know it. It's a, this is a Cortez's map, uh, done in 1524. You will notice it already has a plaza right here, and here is the original, his representation of the original grid plan town and plaza that the Aztec Mistec had uh, designed. There's another uh, plan at Tenochtitlan. And you will note that the plaza and the spaces are regularly designed um, and long before this 1573 codification in Europe. Not only that, this is not showing up very well, um, in Europe at that time, in the 1520-1524 period of time, most cities were medieval and were windy streets. This is an example of Seville, uh, Sevilla and with its windy streets, which doesn't show up very well in this story. So, um, thinking this through, it became pretty clear to me, which it wasn't for some reason to architectural historians, that when you take historical evidence literally, and spatial evidence, literally, that the plazas in the New World were older than the ones in Europe, too. Even the law of the Indies was 50 years after the establishment of, uh, well, it turns out about 17 plaza new towns in the New World, and that therefore European examples could not possibly have been the sole derivation of the plaza new town grid plan design. At the same time, I went to the archaeological evidence in which they taught me about superposition, which I didn't know, which superposition is nothing more than what it sounds like. It is building right on top of what was there. And in fact, what you find if you look at these are sites in Belize. There are not that many continuous occupation archaeology sites in which they go from pre-Columbian through the colonial period to the present. That's what the continuous occupation is all about. So where you would see what the indigenous site was looking like, and you can see where the Spaniards, in fact, built right on top. And so here's a consolidated first church at Lamanai on the remains of a Tulum-like temple. Don't worry, Tulum is a, is a Maya site in, uh, the, in the Yucatan. Um, and in fact, what was going on is a number of sites have plazas built right over the original indigenous site including in Mexico City, remember in Tochtenotichlan. Here you have this very elaborate, I'll go back to this, the, remember that city, plan. Here's Tenochtitlan with a center plaza and a grid plan town here, 1524, and the Spanish come along, and there's great debate of why they did it, and that we don't have time to talk about, but the Spanish built right over the original plaza, keeping all the same spatial relations, used the same laborers who built the plazas for the, for the Aztec city, and um, turned stones over even to leave, keep some of the meaning of the sacred space, because these were sacred spaces, and the space was sacred to the indigenous peoples in Mesoamerica, um, and didn't change the spatial relations at all. So in fact, here you can see in contemporary Mexico City, and not a fabulous slide, but here is the Templo Mayor of um, the last temple of the Aztec, I guess you said Aztec king, that sounds so strange, but that's what it is. And here's a cathedral on the plaza in, uh, at the Socorro in Mexico City, in Tenochtitlan. Right, well here and there side by side, but there's, they're actually, it's superposed, the superposition. And, in fact, here's another slide of the colonial buildings, and there's a great story that, in fact, as they keep excavating this, the Temple Mayor in Mexico City, it's destabilizing the ground on which all the colonial buildings are built, which is, I think, really fabulous, and they're getting shaky. And so the colonial architects and historians are hysterical that the archaeologists stop digging up the ruins because it's all on uh, lakes. Again, I don't know what you know about Mexico City, but it was 
I'll build up very spongy soil. So as you lift up these heavy, heavy stones, things it literally is moving, the ground is moving and destabilizing the colonial path. So it's sort of mm -hmm. literally the architecture of the indigenous past and the architecture of the colonial past, since they're right on top of each other, it's whose whose history is going to be reconstructed and, and, and presented. And as many of you know, uh, the Sokolov still today is a de uh, demonstration center for indigenous rights. And the, the story ends for me in that uh, Here's a case of where uh, a Eurocentric written history, a written history by our cultural historians in this case, um, completely dominated the literature and thinking for 40 years of uh, what the meaning was of the Latin, the Spanish American Plaza, really not the Latin American Plaza, but the Spanish American Plaza. And that if you really took seriously the archaeology, the ethno history, the visual evidence, look at the architecture anew, that is pretty clear that that couldn't possibly have happened in the order in which they're saying it is. And in fact, it's as much an indigenous space as any, as any other space. And that when in interpreting, as Lefebvre does, the Spanish American Plaza as a symbol of oppression and colonialism, it's not that it wasn't. It's true. The Spanish did come in and pave over and enslaved workers. But it isn't so totally true. In other words, when you look at places like um, the plaza in Yucatan, in Merida, um, you can actually find effigies buried right in the plaza space. And if you argue that what was important to uh, Maya and Aztec peoples or Mixteca peoples um, was the location, the spatial location, the center of the universe, the point of power, that one can see that even though somebody else was covering it over, as long as that space stays intact and it, it said that it retained a lot of its original meaning and that these are solely syncretic spaces. They're not solely spaces of European domination, but can also be seen still as spaces of, of indigenous local power and have remained so, and that they become contested spaces. And I would argue you pull back from the Eurocentric or European um, sort of interpretation of this that these can be still seen as indigenous spaces in terms of their spatiality. Okay, so that's one, not exactly what you guys have been talking about, but it's another way in which a spatial methodology, and it all focuses around a theory of the social production of space. It's who produced it, right? Literally who produced it. And looking very carefully at who produced it and being willing to question whether what's in the written text is really who produced it, because turned out it didn't. And if everybody hadn't told me that the Costa Rican plaza wasn't European, and if I hadn't gone to Europe and looked at all these plazas and said, but these are all too young, and then talked to the archaeologist and went to a rare book library where I spent six months in archives looking for early maps of, of plazas, I wouldn't have ever come across this. I would have just written one more book that said it was a European form. So to me, though a little off our oral history project, I wanted to add it to you. I think it's worth adding, because you want to talk about space. Well, space talks to Spaces have histories. Huh? And they have histories of their production. That's what I was asking the, the last presentation, right, on the Chavez regime. What, take, you know, what is the history of the space, and how far can you push it? Because in pushing it, I found out something that I would have never known and that I was, believe me, very surprised to find out. Um, and that was very obvious, but nobody had bothered to ask the question through space. Okay. Any questions on that one? Clear? Social production of space? Clear? Okay. Moisture mark. Divergent history. We'll come back to this in the workshop. And for this one, I'm going to do, I'm going to read you a little bit, because I want to make sure I cover Okay, so we're now in Brooklyn, right? Sort of between, either East Flatbush or Williamsburg, depending on how you want to define um, this location. I'm going to read you a little ethnographic snippet and, um, and show you a few pictures. At lunchtime, Moore Street Market is bustling, housed in a squat white cement building that looks more like a bunker than an enclosed food market with its barred windows and painted metal doors. 
The deserted street in the shadow of the looming housing project seems oddly quiet for a busy Monday morning. Upon entering, however, carefully stacked displays of fresh yucca, fresh fruit, yucca, and coriander, passageways lined with cases of water and high ceilings with vestiges of the original 1940s architecture of wooden stalls, bright panels, and ceiling fans reveal another world. Puerto Rican salsa music emanating from the video store competes with uh, Dominican cumbia blaring from the radio inside the glass enclosed counter of a narrow restaurant where rice, beans, empanadas, and arroz con pollo glistening with oil and rubbed with red spice are arrayed. The sm uh, smell of fried plantains fills the air-conditioned space as Puerto Rican pensioners gather at the round metal tables. Let's see. I think there's the interior. This is from this is that 1940s interior. And here I think you can see the round metal tables. Um, gather at round metal tables with red and white striped umbrellas to offer intimate places to sit and talk. A young boy in a Yankees t-shirt orders lunch for his Colombian mother, who is hesitant to pass the security guard perched at the entrance, who thinks she might be asked for her immigration papers, which she did not have. She remains outside in the already blazing Brooklyn sun, searching for a spot to sell flavored ices on the crowded sidewalk near the subway entrance. One of the vendors, Doña Alba, shuts her metal, uh, her metal screen stall, locking away her seven saints oil plastic flowers and First Communion dresses. She tells me about her most recent trip to Latin America and success in obtaining the special orders and medicinal potions for her regular customers. As a young girl from Mexico, she worked her way up from cleaning for white middle class families who at that time still lived in the neighborhood and selling fruit at a street van to now leasing her own retail space. The recent threat of eviction by the New York City Econo uh, Economic Development Corporation, the however, has slowed what little business there has been during the economic recession, and she worries about her future and the enterprise that she has so been so proud of and so painstakingly built. Moore Street Market is the last of nine enclosed markets built by 1941 in New York City to relocate the pushcart vendors and open-air markets that were thought to be health and fire hazards and to supply the modernizing metropolis with safe and affordable food. Four of these markets remain today, Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, Essex Street on the Lower East Side, La Marqueta under the elevated tracks in Harlem, and Moore Street Market in East Williamsburg, uh, Brooklyn. culturally diverse, mostly Irish, Jewish, and Italian immigrant market. Although the neighborhood had a significant Puerto Rican population by the 1960s, ah, it would fit right into West Side Story, and as late as the early 1970s, some of the original residents and market vendors remained. But the market and the neighborhood physically deteriorated with urban disinvestment during the 70s and 80s. You know, one of the residents blamed the city for turning its back uh, on this neighborhood and uh, ignoring problems uh, caused by poverty and underdevelopment. Anyhow, and then despite an architectural renovation in uh, 1995, its tenuous commercial viability led to a decreasing number of vendors and shoppers, and it was exacerbated in March of 2007 um, when the EDC decided that it would be closed to make way for affordable housing. And so with the threat of closure, the Public Space Research Group, of which I'm a director and I was working with a group of um, students, usually anthropology, environmental psychology, and geography students, um, decided to get involved and try to help formulate a community-based response to the closure plan. <coughs> um, the New York Times became very active in advocating for the uh, market writing that, you know, it's the kind of place that isn't, you know, the same old mall, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, finally, the, the representatives, uh, Nydia Velasquez and Assemblyman Vito Lopez, secured uh, money at $3.2 in federal funding to keep it open. Okay, so um, 
North Street Market is made up of Latinos uh, from Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Mexico, and Nicaragua. All the vendors, both owners and uh, employees, are first-generation immigrants. Uh, Puerto Ricans immigrated to New York in the 1940s, while the Dominicans, Mexicans, and Nicaragua immigrated mostly in the 1980s. Their national cultural identities are spatially inscribed, and it's too bad I don't have, I don't think I have, oops, have a, 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 a top-down view, it would be nice if I did, are spatially inscribed in that the Puerto Rican vendors are located at the market's social and economic heart, around where that cafe is that I showed you before, while, um, and that's where the food and the Caribbean food is played and there's salsa music, while the Nicaraguans and Mexican stalls are located along the periphery. So there's this hierarchy even in how the space is occupied. Uh, first generation immigrants keep ties to their homeland alive through music, food, family, relationships, and visit home. And many travel back and forth from their home countries with goods for sale and carrying gifts and merchandise, which I already mentioned with Doña Alba. Um, the majority of the uh, people who go there are senior pensioners, Puerto Rican pensioners. The men spend their day walking around, sitting on no sitting barriers, going out on the street, coming around, coming back in, having lunch, walking through again, and um, pretty much inhabit the space and take over those, again, the metal tables that I showed you. Uh, Puerto Rican senior women, older women come in, often do their shopping. One, they rarely sit down, even if they buy a snack and go out. So there are these very different embodied spatial patterns in how everyone um, uses the space. Um, on the weekends, the crowd read still remains overwhelmingly Puerto Rican with other Latino customers shopping, but the other Latino customers don't usually join the family groups that are seated on in the tables eating sancocho, which tend to be Puerto Rican. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk more about this um, in the next time, but what what this is about for me theoretically and analytically um, is that here is a space in which we literally were able to trace the movement of bodies on an everyday basis, both everyone who lived outside and all the users inside, as a way of really understanding how this space works. And what began to happen is that there was a very, a, a, a lot of hierarchy and spatial breakdown between different Latino groups that so many of us in New York know about and we don't talk about maybe as much, and competition between groups and dislike between groups uh, in which the Mexican uh, vendors who uh, were uh, like Doña Alba are kept on the periphery by the more senior, older, both older and having a longer time uh, Puerto Rican men who are trying to dominate this market as a Puerto Rican market. And in fact, it has a lot to do with this, this spatial, both spatial and embodied set of practices that has inscribed this market so narrowly as a Puerto Rican market that, in fact, I think that contributes a lot to why it was closed in that outside of this market, there are Ecuadorian, Nicaraguan, um, all, uh, many, many different uh, Latino nationality uh, individuals working on vendors or selling ices or whatever that are not allowed to work here either because uh, they don't have a spot, um, they're illegal, or even more so because of the way the, um, the space has been controlled and defined as a kind of Puerto Rican space. At the same time as we're going to get into, um, there's a large project next door looming, as I said in the very beginning, which is a very large African American population that is no longer has their foodstuffs sold there. There are new white yuppie hipsters in the neighborhood in which, again, they're not attracted and um, the research that I'll talk about gets into it. But theoretically, what I want to say... Oh, that's, that's um, I want to say, make a theoretical point. Is For me, the ethnography of Moore Street Market revealed how urban public space can link analyses of the body and space, which I've only briefly given you, global, local power relations embedded in space, which we talked about a little bit. The role of language and discursive transformations, which have to do with the music, the cumbia, the competing music, the competing sound, the 
uh, language and the material uh, importance of the architecture. But it's through this embodied space that the global, I think, is integrated into the spaces of everyday life. Embodied, these embodied spaces are sites of translocal, transnational, as well as personal experience. And from this theoretical perspective, Moore Street Market can be understood as a place where people spend the day listening to music from their homeland, eating lunch and working at stalls where they make their livelihood. Simultaneously, they are enmeshed in networks of relationships, transnational circuits and ways of being that extend from the built environment of the market to the towns from where they've migrated and where, in many cases, the products that they sell as well as other family members remain supported by the profits of their commercial endeavors. And I would argue that this is pretty obvious, right? I mean, you know, everybody says, well, yes, of course. But are we really thinking how concretely that this is happening? I mean, we all know about these networks. But what I guess I'm trying to say that it, it, it isn't this abstract set of uh, network relations. It's not this abstract flows of capital and people. It's very concretely in place in Moore Street Market. And by just analyzing that one place, you can see all of those forces at play in, in the everyday bodies and practices of everyday life. And, and that it, it, it got me away from trying to imagine. I used to try to imagine a translocal space in my head, of some imaginary space in which, for me, I live in LA and New York and Costa Rica, say, all at the same time. But certainly LA and New York completely mushed in my mind. you know. And how do I do, study that material? How do I grasp that experientially? And that's what I'm trying to do here. So where it's something that I don't think is so unique, I'm, I'm trying to argue that, or at least I'm, I think I'm on the beginning of an argument that this embodiment, these embodied practices, allow us to concretely see how individuals and their feelings Can you just give me a little bit of difference between translocal and transnational? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, transnational is... Yeah, I know transnational. You know transnational. Translocal is just a way of getting a not dealing with it at a level of the nation state, but translocal meaning that where I live in LA, sort of West Los Angeles, the house or whatever, and where I live in New York are somehow related. It isn't just necessarily two nation states. I'm not talking about transnational coverage. I'm not necessarily talking about borders and boundaries. I'm talking about, the now I'll use the word place, the context for everyday life in two different environments so that I really am trying to focus on uh, translocal space at a local level, at the body level. So I'm thinking of, well, I mean, I think lots of people use translocal in a lot of different ways. But for me, I'm really talking about space in a very local sense, not in an abstract sense. Not When I say transnational, I'm thinking more of the flows and the flow economy and the role of the state. It's all involved in translocal, but it's at a much more, much more intimate level. Anybody else have any, you know, there's, I tend to like the word translocal better than transnational. For me, it really keeps me in space and what I was trying to, you know, I keep trying, I'm trying to find ways in which to study translocality, let's put it that way, material, without having to resort to uh, imagining that people are thinking whatever, to, to try to embody it in, an, in our very bodies. Because most of us live these translocal lives. I mean, we're living in a world of translocality. Um, I think that I think I'll move on. Um, yeah, I mean, I go as through the embodied spaces of their social relations that the market is simultaneously a local and translocal place. More street market for most of your users is both a cultural home in Brooklyn and a, and a native homeland located in the same space-time continuum. I mean, who made this point in the early 1990s, Father Rouse, his, his notion of a new social space. Um, and I think what I'm trying to do is give it a sort of solid, concrete spatial analysis. Okay, gated communities and um, co-ops. Uh, any questions on Moore Street? We'll return to Moore Street Market, so you'll we'll talk about how you how you use histories to construct the market and what you do with it, um, since it was an applied project. Um, this is a little harder because this covers about 
mean, the, the Plaza project took 10 years, but the gated community and now the co-op, the gated community took about 15, and now I'm in the middle of working on co-op, so we're covering a lot of years of time. Um, yeah, it's very long. Could we open this one, too, maybe? Yeah. Sorry. We could even open this door. I've been trying to, I, I, I think since your interest is really on history, I just need to give you a little context of what I was doing. I, I, um, I spent, I spent, my sister lives in a gated community, right? I couldn't figure out why. And so, um, and that's how it all started. <laughs> I just didn't know what she was doing there. She lived in San Antonio, Texas. And in 1992, I went to visit her, and there she was. And, um, just couldn't figure it out. I, and so I started looking for the literature. There wasn't anything. So that's a partially part of the answer is nobody's also ever written anything qualitative uh, on middle class uh, uh, co-ops here in New York City. So what happens is I go, well, you know, I need to know just basic information. And then what happens is I get involved in larger, larger projects. So here, you're seeing me at the end of the gated community project. and. Um, <laughs> you know, I am sort of looking at gated communities with spatial enclosure, wall gates, and guards, creating this safe and secure environment. And I have so much to say about this. I, I, it's hard to summarize it, but I, what I started was is I've been working in parks and cultural diversity and public spaces, and then I went to this highly privatized space. I now mostly work on privatized spaces how public spaces get privatized. So that's that larger theme. And the other larger theme of my work overall is how nice the white middle class people re-inscribe uh, social exclusion and uh, racial segregation back on the landscape. In other words, how um, people like myself re-inscribe uh, re social segregation time and time again, regardless of what kinds of laws we change. Um, we, Regardless through our everyday practices and through things, oh, things that seem very. Um, you just hit the touch pad. She put back on. Uh, late, but when I went to study dating, I was particularly interested in space, just like most of you. And I went in and I did residential histories, which I'll talk about a little bit with people who moved to gated communities. I did New York. I did seven different gated communities uh, in New York and Texas, so I had some variation. I also did a set in Mexico City. And I did these long residential histories of where people lived before and why did they move to a gay community. And in the context, so that's the history part. But in the context of that, what comes out was something you're going to see in a minute is that this incredible fear of people living that they think they feel so safe and secure, but maybe they're not. And maybe workers are going to get them, or maybe the construction guys. Um, and I'll show you some quotes. But, but I'm not going to be able to give you the whole spectrum. But it, that's where the history is. It's like in the Moore Street Market, it's the history of the vendors, these Latino vendors and the immigrants. Here the history was these residential histories, which is a different part. And if we had enough time, I mean, I guess I could have brought you in the residential histories to show you how I worked for this. But for me, the theory of it got really important. And what else became important is that it wasn't just the spatial enclosure, which is, if I remember what I was saying in the beginning, it wasn't just the gates and the guards and the walls, which was enough, right? incredible material environment, the social production of space that I already talked about that was important, and the embodied living in, you know, my sister has alarms and a wall around her house, and she's in a gated community, and there's no crime in the neighborhood. None. None at all. So in this, that whole place, there's no crime. So it's this very interesting kind of physical environment in the context of what else is going on. But what also happened in this research is I became very interested that gating wasn't the sole reason uh, that social relations were changing. Uh, because what I also found is it wasn't very community, people didn't know each other, people remained fearful, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of conflict in these gated communities, but it wasn't just because of the gating. So I moved a little bit away from space, and I think then the moral of this story is space won't explain everything. As important as it is, it's a good place to start, but sometimes it leads you to something else, and it led me to issues of governance. Uh, and this issue of governance, that these are all organized as condominiums. That's a kind of common interest development. It's a law, governance, and institutional structure that you're probably not terribly interested in, 
that has a homeowners association board. And so some of the changes that I saw and some of the issues of fear, I feel, uh, after having done the years of research, were not just based on the spatial environment, um, and I got this from those residential histories. But in order to be really sure that I was right, the governance played a part, not just the walls and gates and guards, which are obvious, or at least were obvious to me, I began to work on co-ops. And um, I did another study of the privatization of housing. Um, and you can just read this. Um, this. And I became interested in what I call securitization, which is the interlocking of spatial legal governance and financial systems of control. So here you have an example of a project that starts with essentially a spatial methodology, residential history, but turns into a theoretical project having to do with securitization, which is much broader. And now I'm doing on co-ops, and I think, you know, I'm actually looking at other kinds of privatization. I have a graduate student working at charter schools, which is a privatization of public education, or um, all of you can think of, you know, privatization of, of base, you know, of the uh, Dodgers Stadium with putting in all the malls or whatever. Okay. Um, the history of private collective ownership, then I get into a history that was uh, elite history starting with uh, this is Tuxedo Park in New York. Um, I need to talk a little bit if I'm going to look at private uh, collective ownership. I just want to say that um, I'm trying to think of what's important for you. Both co-ops and gated communities are forms that evolve from a racist history of deed restriction, restrictive covenants, and selective lending. Um, so here we have an, another kind of historical intervention in that you need to look at the history of the production, but you're going to now compare it to the history of people moving here. And in 1948, when the Supreme Court call, you know, says that deed restriction and restrictive covenants are now illegal, that they won't be defended in the court, everyone thinks that racial segregation in housing is going to end. But in fact, of course, mortgage segregation, redlining, and all the other financial strategies for uh, creating housing segregation were still remained in practice. But what also happens is with the demise of very obvious racist uh, restrictive covenants, you have the rise of common interest developments, starting with 1928 and the development of collective private property regimes. And you kind of go, well, what's that all about? And you have the beginning of co-ops. But you have private citizens being able to own proper property collective and collectively and to decide then who will use it. And in the case of co-ops, which were studied, started not by Marxists and communists and everybody we think, but by very wealthy landowners here in New York City who bought apartment buildings so that they could keep other people out, so that they could live with just people like themselves, bought up buildings, divided up shares in these limited, in these Corporations. This is all done by 1940s corporate law in New York City, uh, and we're able to discriminate then without legal, without you know, without the restriction. Anyway, so then there's this difference in ownership structure in gated communities. Um, the way you keep other people out is is really you really can. It's only by what we call laissez-faire racism, but in other words, the cost of the house. Uh, and then you use the walls, gates, and guards as a landscape feature. And in fact, African Americans are less likely to live in gated communities because they do read the, the gates, guards, and uh, all of that spatial apparatus as discriminatory. However, that's not true of Latino or Asian uh, American groups. Uh, Co-ops, on the other hand, um, and, and how uh, condominiums work, again, probably a little more than you want to know, is there's, that there's land that's owned in common, but you own your own house or your own apartment. In co-ops, it's not that way. The whole building or land or whatever, or any units are owned collectively. You only own shares in a house, and that creates a very different thing. So those of you, who live, have any of you ever tried to live in a co-op? I mean, do any of you live in co-ops? All right, so you know you have to go through a fun financial vetting before you can go into, um, before you can buy a place, and co-op boards are notorious for refusing prospective buyers. And even though they're supposed to be very democratic places, so far in our research, and we've done about 40 interviews.
Um, other than if you live in a small co-op, you're more likely to be in a more democratic uh, setting. But even though there are specific rules, Rochdale principles, that are supposed to adhere to, um, co-ops tend to be very restrictive and create um, certain kinds of um, discrimination and certainly minority members feel discriminated against. Anyway, the moral of the story is gated communities create the securitized environment through spatial closure. Clarification on uh, your place co um, collective privatization. Collective um, private ownership. Yeah. Private, yeah. Well, I, I guess the word privatization. I mean, was it something that was not private? Isn't it going from like a single owner yeah. of the building to but a collective to, owner? Yeah, so collective that, owner. Yeah. It's not that it wasn't private. I mean, houses were owned privately. What was the change is that a, a group of owners can own something together. Right. Which is, you can do bigger and bigger spaces. I mean, we've always had... I guess my question is, why isn't that collectivization rather than privatization? Oh. Well, it could be. Ideally, ideally, it would be collectivization. But is it collective, well, collectivization? I think of it as a public project, right? Mm -hmm. right. So maybe my own ideology is to make it private the whole time. No, but it, what, I mean, there's all the other space. That's a good point. There's all the other space in that data. So, in your, if you live, you own a suburban house, you don't also own the street, and you can't close off your street and say that no one else can come in. Right. Right. But in the case of a co-op, like it's not really. It's yeah, just it's from something other than private to private. Right. It's pri it's a private housing to a group of people owning private housing. But what's interesting is it's a different governance. I guess it's the difference. I, it's a really good point that it's the different governance structure that has to be put in place, and you end up um, having a board. We're really running out of time, so I'm going to, I really feel like I, I took on too much with this, I think. <laughs> but um, methods for gated community, and I'm not going to get to discourse analysis and conversation interviews, but I'm just going to show you some of my gated communities. Methodology for co-ops, it's the same, but the depth of the residential history is shorter. Uh, most of my co-op residents, um, the, the, the history is less important, and there's a lot more on this application process. Um, and these are some co-ops. I do in small, medium, and large co-ops, under 50, 50 to 150, and then 150 to 300 units, just because that turns out to be relevant. I've been working on this for about three years, but we're not finished yet, just to give you the scale of the building makes a big difference in what goes on. But on the other hand, there is surprisingly, it is surprisingly similar. Um, and it's surprisingly similar, some of the conversations to what goes on in gated communities. In terms of representation problems, board participation, social interaction, they're very similar. Very different in terms of a sense of safety and security. And that, I will argue, has to do with, in a co-op, you can be very sure of who moves in. You can control that people like us, is the term they use, live in the building because you can financially vet and exclude anybody you think doesn't fit which you cannot do in the gated community. So interestingly enough, you feel safer in a co-op that doesn't have the spatial apparatus, but has the financial apparatus. And I'll come back to this. That's that levels of securitization that I'm talking about, that there's spatial exclusion, but then there is um, you know, money exclusion, and ultimately then there's this application process. Um, attribute this difference in the, to the way that security is created in one case by spatial enclosure, but with the addition of this financial vetting. But I want to just give you a sense of, um, so for example, this is Donna's concern about her son living in a gated community. Just to give you a little flavor of what the interviews are like, Donna goes, and that's what's been most important, my husband, to get the children out here where they can feel safe and feel safe. If they can go out in the streets and not worry that someone's going to grab them, we feel so secure, and maybe that's wrong too. Says that. In what sense, Donna? You know, we've got workers out here, and we still think, oh, they're safe out here. In the other neighborhood, I never let them out of my sight for a minute. So you can see where in these residential histories you get what it was like before, and that that works really, really well. Um, here's Karen and Frank. That the one thing you did this is still a community. You say is that undocumented workers uh, concern you, or is it that they're construction workers or undocumented workers in general? By the way, this is 
just crazy as fuck. You're carrying it like they can slip in and slip out. There's no record of these guys at all. They're here today and gone tomorrow. And actually, interestingly enough, I just went to the AAG and I heard very similar quotes uh, on the border between Bangladesh and India um, along the wall part. Exactly the same discourse. It was just amazing in this completely different context. So there's something about borders and context. Um, so, you know, by, just again to give you some sense of where it goes, co-op residents feel safer due to the doorman. And so you can see, as Yvonne says, I've seen them stop people at the door who they don't recognize, so you feel kind of safe. You know you're going to be in the building with people that are supposed to be here, all right? Which you have also. Okay. Vanessa explains, there's a certain feeling like knowing everyone had to go through the same agony to get by the co-op board, that my next door neighbor is this ex-murderer, or that they're not paying their rents by selling drugs. And then, or Patricia, I really trust, huh? They could be either of those things, because it's finance. It's both. Better, but it's both. <laughs> it's, no, it's, con it's conflated here. Yeah, and in the longer paper, I really work it out. And I really trusted the homogeneity of that building that I was not going to find someone so different from myself. Yeah, no, absolutely, it's completely because it's finance. Um, but here's the important part, I think. Some residents perceive this as having racist implications. Do I need to read it? You will. Um, he says, things they won't ask you in the job interview that you could sue for, like, do you cook any ethnic food that smells offensive? He was asked in his or Or similarly, that explains her concern. I think co-op boards, and this I found in small, liberal, park slope co-op just recently. Similar kind of stuff, which you would not expect. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on here? You really do. Because other things, the small boards are much more democratic, more people participate. It's the larger co-ops get more and more no representation, which I'm not going to get into. But the event goes, I think co-op boards can get away with discretion without doing it outwardly because they don't have to tell you what they like and what they don't like. And then there's laissez-faire racism that I referred to. Here's Gary saying, he's saying this, you know, because first of all, there's an income stream, this screen. By the time you enter a building like that, people have at least can afford to rent and they can mortgage a million dollar condo. Like the apartment, I bought this for six fifty. That one, the one that's identical to this just got sold for a million two and the person that bought it was not acceptable to the board. Remember, the board can turn down somebody they don't like. And then it got resold for approximately a million. So by the time you're at that level, uh, you're colorblind, but you don't see many colors. <laughs> so, living with people like us. Thus, the desire to live with similar people, with people who behave in a similar way, perceived as normative, but the structures to produce it, are, are structurally complex and I would argue hidden to the residents themselves. And in this case, not just spatially hidden. Um, hello. There. Gated communities provide this through the covenants, which we did talk about the surveillance of wall. But the co-ops provide homogeneity through the application and selection process. Um, and here, the co-ops feel much safer and Yet this desire for homogeneity produces an environment in which minority residents feel singled out and where racist and exclusionary behavior can be more easily exhibited. And actually, it turns out that gated community residents see, internally see gating as less racist than co-ops, while gated communities are seen as racist from the outside. In some ways, they are probably less exclusionary than co-ops, which are the more collective more liberal, have these Rochdale principles of collectivity and democracy. Um, together. I don't know, I think that's the end. Oh, and you've been talking about neoliberalism, do I need to say that this has everything to do with neoliberalism? You know? And uh, here, just at the bottom, it's the interweaving of space, law, governance, finance, and their institutional practices that evoke residents' fear and anxiety and wanting to live like us. And so you're sort of saying, Seth, what does this have to do with methodology, maybe, or space? But it's right here. It's like, here's space. Well, what I've done is complicated for you. I'm adding law, I'm adding governance, I'm adding finance, which you could do with any of the studies that we heard today, be it the park or the, any of the things that you were talking about. 
and adding the emotion and the discourse to the space ultimately for me gets me back to social exclusion and social segregation and how it is that things don't transform and don't change over time, which is my goal. And where does history and oral history fit into this? It's part of the methodology, but it is integrated in this particular last case into a kind of theoretical moment by comparative method coming in and integrating those histories into some theoretical questions I have. And I'm happy for the next 50 minutes to take questions about those histories um, now that I've given you a little time. Thank you so much.